Hey, I'm Alex. And I'm Caitlin. And today we are learning about BJCP Category 1, Standard American Beers. If this is the first video in the series that you're watching, be sure to watch our intro video first so that you understand what is happening here. And then you can come back to this one. That link is right here. There are four styles in this category. The first style we'll be going through is American Light Lager. Mmm. Yeah. <laughs> Pre-S to this whole video, it gets better. Stick with us. So the classic examples of this style are Bud Light, Coors Light, Keystone Light, Michelob Light, Miller Light, Old Milwaukee Light. The thing you have to realize about BJCP is it's all about classic styles. No one's claiming that these are the best beers in the world, but what we are claiming is they are the best beers within oh, this, this category, category, American Light Lager. So for this episode today, we will be evaluating Coors Light will be tasting the Rockies. Coors briefly made light lager in the early 1940s. Modern versions were first produced by Rheingold in 1967 to appeal to diet conscious drinkers, hence light, but only became popular starting in 1973 after Miller Brewing acquired the recipe and marketed the beer heavily to sports fans with the Taste Great Less Filling campaign. So that's how they get you is you drink a lot of beer, you don't get drunk, so you go back for more. And you advertise heavily on the s I mean, I can't, the big game. You <laughs> advertise heavily on the big sport game. It's a really interesting thing about this beer. It is meant to be pretty delicate. This is a style where they are intentionally removing malt and replacing it with things like rice and corn to thin out the body and neutralize the flavor. It's meant to be really light and crisp. We're also expecting a lot of carbonation. Another really interesting thing about these styles is uh, DMS or dimethyl sulfide is an off flavor in a lot of beers. It kind of tastes like cooked corn. It can be very vegetal and it's actually acceptable in low thresholds in some of these American light lagers. The overall impression should be, like Alex said, highly carbonated, very light bodied, nearly flavorless, designed to be consumed very cold so that you continue to not taste it. And that's why this is a genius marketing ploy. The whole, if it's cold enough, we will turn, the, the mountains will turn blue. They know that the quality of this beer depends on it being ice, ice cold. Classic example, let's try it. When you're pouring beers for competition, I actually like to pour more or less straight down. We're trying to intentionally rouse some head. I know that might not necessarily be how you pour every time that you're pouring a beer, uh, but when I'm judging, I always wanna make sure there is a head. And I do wanna look at it right away. I wanna make sure that if there is a head that's there initially, I note it on my score sheet. And then if it dissipates later, I can comment on that as well. So let's pull out the aroma before it fades away. I'm getting a lot of floral, like sweet floral apple blossom. Mm. It's like a perfumey. Yeah, if you, if you squint your brain a little bit, you might be convinced that there's cider in this glass. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a stretch. I but it's, it's not a flaw. No. It's nice. I would say there's a sort of a honey note to it. I do get some of that corny, corny corn. Yeah. Like if there was corn honey. Yeah, I wouldn't say it tastes like cooked corn. This isn't classic no. DMS to me, but I wouldn't be surprised actually if there's a little bit of corn flaked maize in this recipe. Let's not forget that this is a lager, and part of what comes with it being a lager is that generally we're expecting a very clean fermentation profile. We're not getting a, a huge amount of esters, although maybe some of that apple could be coming from the esters. Some American lager yeast will throw off a little bit of apple. You want to go back to the appearance? Yeah. This is exactly what I was talking about before. If we were evaluating the appearance now, uh, there is no head to speak of. A good score sheet isn't just a single moment in time. It talks about how the beer evolves for maybe mm -hmm. the 10 to 15 minutes while you're evaluating it. So usually you do go back to aroma. You maybe bounce between aroma and flavor. How would we describe the color of this beer? Um, well, the lighting in here is not awesome right now, <laughs> but I would say like light straw, crystal clear. Very, very clear. And this is about as light a colored beer as we're ever going to come across. So I'm kind of simultaneously making a note of mouthfeel as well as flavor with my first sip. My first impression with the mouthfeel was, whoa, carbonation. And I might note that right away, although I generally do fill out the flavor section of the score sheet before getting to mouthfeel. In terms of flavor, what are you getting right off the bat? college. <laughs> there is a little bit of sweetness. So mm -hmm. that 
apple blossomy aroma definitely carries over into the flavor. And I agree, there's a very floral quality to this hop and there is actually some bitterness that counterbalances that little bit of sweetness. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to not forget that those things exist even in a really light, delicate beer like this. So overall impression, I would even say on the score sheet, this is something that I could easily picture myself drinking on a hot, sunny day. It is very refreshing. Uh, you can go back for more. Uh, yeah, all four of these category one beers are often described as lawnmower beers. And the idea is, yeah, on a hot summer day, you could imagine yourself outside mowing the lawn, drinking these beers. And, and this very much fits in that sense. I wouldn't say this is one of my favorite beers in the world, but I would say this is a world-class example of this beer, of this style. And if I were going to make a complaint about this as it relates to the style, it might actually be that there's too much malt character in this beer, which Not is- Not watery enough. We got brighter. Moving on to the second style in this category. We have category 1B, American Lager. So basically this is just the big brother of American Light Lager. The classic examples, if you are following along and want to taste something, incredibly delicious, that's sarcasm, are Budweiser, Coors Original, Grain Belt Premium Lager, Miller High Life, Pabst Blue Ribbon, or Special Export. Today we'll be drinking PBR. Pabst Blue Ribbon. How do I make that thing focus? So, like I said, as opposed to American Light Lager, this is basically just going to be the same thing except everything a little bit more. A little bit more flavor, a little bit more aroma, a little, little bit more mouthfeel, a little bit more alcohol. Yeah, but don't let that trick you into thinking that this is a big beer. This is still a baby beer. Uh, according to the guidelines, this can be anywhere from 4.2% ABV on up to about 5 Historically, this beer is true from Germany. <laughs> the German immigrants came to the U.S., brought this style with them, and as I said in the history with American Light Lager, that was our watered-down version to appease calorie counters. So this is more true to kind of a old world style German lager. But then over time it's just gotten stripped and stripped and stripped to the point where yes some of the malt is being replaced with other ingredients like maize or rice which a German brewer would never consider doing. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay let's taste it. Okay aroma go. So this is interesting, obviously a different brewer. We had a Coors before and we we're not just doing this straight step up and doing Coors Original. We're tasting Pabst Blue Ribbon. And I do think it's noticeably different in terms of maybe the yeast esters, in terms of maybe the, um, the, the hop profile, whatever they used here. It's still very delicate. It's not screaming hops to me. I'm definitely getting way more malt profile mm -hmm. than the previous one. So this is more of, it's still a sweet, overall corn but it's like husky sweet corn yeah yeah I, I like husky there's almost a crackery quality to it mm -hmm. what do you think about the hops how are we describing those is there almost a little something herbal or spicy a little bit i've had pbr before where the hop character was a little bit more dank mm -hmm. not overly dank like something was wrong or that it was light struck but i'm not getting that so much right now yeah in terms of the appearance, right when it poured, there was a nice thick head and it's actually retained quite well. And that's a noticeable difference between this one and the light lager that we just evaluated where the head dissipated so quickly. And it does make sense that in a, a maltier, I use maltier very, very lightly here, uh, but, but that it would be a little bit better retained and stick around a little bit longer. In terms of color, it's definitely a notch darker than the Coors Light. Uh, still crystal clear. I could read through this if it didn't distort <laughs> the letters. Let's let's try it. So this is not nearly as highly carbonated. I was going to say that was the was. first thing I noticed. It's noticeably a thicker, fuller bodied compared to Coors Light mouthfeel. I still wouldn't call it full body, but Coors Light is watery, lightest body possible, and this is more medium light. I'm reading verbatim from the 2015 BJCP style guidelines. Very highly carbonated with slight carbonic bite on the tongue. I wholeheartedly oh, disagree. And since that is what we're looking for- points on the score sheet. Granted, 
Mouthfeel's only five points, but I do think this is one of these areas where the lack of carbonation might bleed over into other areas. Mm -hmm. You're talking about how okay, lack of carbonation is also relating to the, the perception of the body. I would also say a lot of times these beers count on carbonation to counterbalance sweetness. Yeah, and uh, this is very sweet right mm -hmm. now. So would you give it a four out of five, three out of five? Uh, I'm, for mouthfeel? I'm deciding between a two and three Ooh. out of five. Okay, so after pouring it again, it is the appropriate carbonation. Yeah, I just got a fresh pour and it, it is coming out of the can carbonated. And this is an important thing to recognize when you're judging. If you're taking 15 minutes, which is the target, if you're taking the tasting exam, you have 15 minutes per beer. Even in, within 15 minutes, the profile of a beer can change. And mm -hmm. in this case, we were talking about the aroma and the appearance for so long that a lot of the carbonation had dissipated. I was fortunate enough to be able to refresh the sample and in doing so, recognized, oh, actually there is maybe closer to medium, medium high carbonation. I still find it to be a little bit light compared to very high with some carbonic bite, mm -hmm. uh, but it is more within the range of being appropriate. So now I'm thinking more like a three or a four for mouthfeel. Cool, so I'm getting a lot of caramel character from the malt. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. A caramel sweetness, mm -hmm. maybe I should say. It's interesting. Any of you homebrewers out there would know there are a lot of different ranges of caramel malts, different Lova Bond. Uh, so uh, you might get a caramel malt that is C10. And that's going to be just a very light, um, almost candy like caramel, on up to the really dark ones, which are more toffee and treacle. This is not like that. This is that really delicate candy like mm -hmm. caramel. And I don't know if they've used caramel malt, but I agree. There is yeah. some sort of a very, very, very faint caramel quality to it. Either way, even if you don't know all the different types of caramel malt, it is good to be able to use that vocabulary and say, oh, this is toffee caramel versus candy apple caramel mm -hmm. versus caramel cookies. The more descriptive you can get in writing out your score sheet, the better and the more helpful it's going to be for that home brewer to understand where you're coming from and what you're getting from their beer. I personally find the malt in this to be um, quite honey-like. And I, honey is a descriptor that I use actually in a fair number of lighter lagers, not because I think I should, but because I genuinely perceive it in a lot of these types of beers. And I find the sweetness to be pretty, pretty honey-like. Overall impression. Still tastes like college, but like <laughs> senior year college. Like hipster college. Like hipster college. Like first year out of college. It's a good beer. It's it's not flawed. And so in terms of scores, we, we are going to be giving this a higher score. But I personally find that this is not as close to the classic ideal as the Coors Light was that we evaluated. And that's so maybe because closer of, to like 39? Yeah, I think it's high 30s. Obviously, this is a classic example, but I think the specific can that we have is a little bit undercarbonated, and that's mm -hmm. going to be the case. Uh, not every example of a commercial beer is identical to every other example of a commercial beer. Mm -hmm. These places strive for consistency, but we also don't know much about how it was handled post-brewery. What sort of distribution truck did it come out in? Was it stored cold? Uh, what? How old is it? And for that reason, you might taste a classic example of a beer, especially a foreign beer, mm -hmm. uh, that is just old and musty and mm -hmm. um, infected. Yeah, so that's good to know if you're following along with us. You're obviously not drinking the same exact can that we are. So if we are tasting something that you are like, I don't get that at all, it's okay that you don't get it. Or if you're tasting like rotting meat and we're not mentioning that, you probably have a bad bottle and that's just a good practice to say, okay, if this were a homebrew competition and I got this severely flawed bottle, what would I rate it? I think but, it's harder to rate top beers actually than it is to rate flawed ones. Absolutely. If your beer tastes like rotting meat, ask yourself the question, did you just eat some rotting meat before you <laughs> tasted the beer? If you did, don't do that. The third style in this category is a cremali. Mm aka cream ale. <laughs> and if you're following along at home, the classic examples that you can pick up are Genesee cream ale. I'm going to say Liebutschaner cream ale. Little King's cream ale. New Glarus spotted cow. Wisconsin, you're so lucky. Old style and Sleeman cream ale. This was one that we actually had a little bit of a challenge locating, partially because the one that we really wanted, the new Glarus Spotted Cow, is only available in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I also assumed that we'd be able to get old style. We saw it everywhere when we lived in Chicago, uh, but it's not distributed out here to Oregon. So we ended up with the Genesee 
And I actually had to go to a gas station to buy this beer. Insert clip. In order to get very fine beers like Genesee Cream Ale, you have to go to very fine shops like KC Food Market. Uh, so historically, this is really interesting because this is the attempt to emulate a lager, a, a sort of like an American standard lager, but as an ale. Uh, if you actually look at uh, Genesee's website or the way that they market their cream ale, they're marketing it as all of the smoothness and crispness of a lager in an ale. And, and that seems almost counterintuitive that that's what you'd be trying to do, but that is what this style is trying to do. It's trying to be a, a smooth, balanced, delicate ale. And I think the style is really confusing for a lot of people because it's called a cream ale, but there is no cream in it. You don't want cream in your beer. Pro tip. I've actually talked to some people who work at our local homebrew supply shop, FH Steinbart, and they've said, oh, we had people come in asking, oh, and when do I add the cream to my cream ale? When do I add the milk to my milk stout? The answer is never. Don't. Please don't. don't. Do that. I don't want to drink that beer in a homebrew competition. It's more about the creamy mouth feel, which is why it's called a cream ale. So no cream, no lactose, lackeys, you're good. Okay, so this should be, again, a clean, well-attenuated, flavorful American lawnmower beer, easily drinkable and refreshing with more character than typical American lagers. So compared to the previous two, this is again going to be another step up in terms of flavor, aroma, kind of everything. And really the big difference here between cream ale and the American lager is uh, the possible impact of yeast. Mm -hmm. uh, we might have a little bit more of a fruity yeast ester because it is an ale. It is not a lager, although it is trying to be a lager. All right, quick first impressions of the appearance. Very clear, thick, creamy head. Yours is uh, a little bit thicker because of the way that I poured it. Let's get in the aroma. Ooh, Ooh. there's a lot more malt character to this one than the ones we have been. And hop. Mm -hmm. So in terms of hop, I'm getting a lot of earthy hops. Grainy malt. Grainy, bready, and maybe a little something corn-like. And I actually don't think that this is DMS. Again, DMS no. is possible in here. Uh, but actually, this style typically uses a large amount of six-row malt. It's going to impart a little bit more of a husky, corn-like flavor, but really it's used for its diastatic power. I'm not going to get into that right now, uh, but it is pretty characteristic in this style. I actually just got a soap-like aroma, hmm. and I smelled my hand to make sure it was in my hand. So if you are judging beer, be careful about the soap you use, if it's really perfumey soap. It seems really nitpicky, but I've used really floral soap, and I was like, everything smells like floral hops. I can't get it again though. It's maybe a little cidery smelling. Yeah. Not in a flawed way, but. I am mostly just getting crusty bread. Mm. I get that, but it's not overpowering. Mm. There's that creamy mouthfeel. Yeah. It's so smooth. Yeah, very balanced, mm -hmm. I would say. There is a fair amount of sweetness and, and a creaminess in the mouthfeel, but mm -hmm. it's all balanced out by pretty high carbonation and a little bit of bitterness. But something I noticed right away and this is a good descriptor to note is that the sweetness falls like right on the center of my tongue yeah. um, so if you can get that specific that's even better so i think that there's actually a, a lot to comment on in the mouthfeel in this beer which is pretty rare a lot of times mouthfeel is a section that i struggle to fill up but i think but, that's what cream ale is all about and the, the the creaminess is noteworthy the carbonation is noteworthy I actually find that with the carbonation, it just sort of coats my tongue and leaves it feeling a little prickly, so I can describe it even beyond just saying high carbonation. I can say high carbonation, a little bit of carbonic bite, uh, bubbles leave a prickly sensation on the tongue. There's almost something cotton candy-like in the sweetness. Mm. So the overall impression here is this is a clean, well-attenuated, flavorful American lawnmower beer. And I, I want to pick kind of all those things apart. I think it is clean. There isn't mm -hmm. any sort of enormous ester. It is, it is well fermented. Well attenuated means that it's crisp and dry. The, uh, the initial sugar that was in there has all been fermented out. I agree. There isn't mm -hmm. residual sweetness you're left with. The lasting impression is dry and crisp. Uh, and then the last part is flavorful. And I would say compared to the last two lagers that we tasted, this is the mm -hmm. most flavorful. 
The final style in this category is American Wheat Beer. So if you're following along at home and want to grab a classic example to try along with us, your choices are Bell's Oberon, Boulevard Unfiltered Wheat Beer, Goose Island 312 Urban Wheat Ale. Oh, we lived in Chicago. And Widmer Hefeweizen. We're going with Widmer because Portland. So here's the deal. We are both members of the Oregon Brew Crew. I'm a current board member. I serve as the education chair for OBC. It's worth adding a little disclaimer that Kurt and Rob Widmer are former members of the Oregon Brew Crew. They are very kind to our club. We are going to be completely unbiased when judging this beer. But this is also kind of, mm, I don't want to say the best classic example, but in terms of the history of this style, this is the American craft beer adaptation of the German Weiss, Weiss beer Weiss, style. Yeah. Um, using a cleaner yeast and more hops. It was first widely popularized by Widmer in the mid-1980s. So this is that. The American wheat beer. Yep. So the interesting thing about this style is the more modern interpretations of it can have a much larger span of what's acceptable. Uh, we actually brewed an American wheat beer at the AHA Big Brew Day, and the version that we brewed has a lot of really modern hops. We're not going to get that in the Widmer Haifa. Uh, this is a very 1980s, 1990s type of American wheat beer where the hop profile is, uh, I would say, almost neutral compared to um, what we made ourselves. There's going to be a clean fermentation character allowing a bready, doughy, or grainy wheat flavor to be complemented by hop flavor and bitterness rather than yeast qualities. So less wheat character than um, the German style that it's based on. So some characteristics of wheat that we're going to expect, and this is not just true of this style, but really all wheat beers, uh, we can generally expect a wheat beer to be a little Whoa. bit cloudier. We can also expect a lot of head retention and a certain uh, mouthfeel. What's your woe about? Dank hop, Ooh. all up in my face. It is light struck. Light yeah. struck happens when light strikes a bottle. <laughs> Uh, so actually, as I said a little bit earlier on, we don't know much about what happened with this bottle from the time that it left the Widmer Brewery, which granted is right here in Portland, and then went to the gas station where I bought this bottle of beer. Presumably, even though this is in a brown bottle, which generally lets in less light than a green bottle or a transparent clear bottle, uh, just a, a small amount of time in direct sunlight can cause a negative reaction with the hops, and that leads to that skunky, light-struck flavor. And to be fair, there are hop varieties that do have a naturally dank flavor and aroma that is desirable in beer. So I wouldn't necessarily have known that this is light struck if it was, say, an IPA, because yeah, it might were, just have some dank ass hops in it. Yeah, if this were an IPA and it smelled like this, I might say like, okay, tell me more. I want to taste <laughs> that beer. It does dissipate though. And then you can get that kind of wheat bread. I still mostly get skunk. I get a little bit of lemon. Definitely doughy, yeasty bread. So appearance, way hazier than anything we've had so far. And that's okay. That's true to style. In, in terms of the guidelines, I actually say that it may range from brilliant to hazy. The haze is certainly acceptable. Um, we said it with the classic styles. One of them is the Boulevard Unfiltered Wheat. They really call out that it's unfiltered. But if a brewery wanted to filter their wheat beer and push it out crisp and clear, it would not be a flaw, which I think is an important thing to remember because if I'm filling out a score sheet and I don't necessarily have the guidelines in front of me and I see a crystal clear wheat beer, I don't want to have that, that um, sort of gut reaction of, oh, but wheat beer is supposed to be hazy. Uh, yeah, it's fine for it to be hazy. We're not knocking it down at all for this, but it can totally be clear. So I don't find that that skunkiness to be as intrusive in the flavor, mm -mm. but it's it is still, still there. there. Yeah, it's this is definitely we're dealing with a light struck sample, which is unfortunate. But again, like we said earlier, this is going to happen with even the most world class beers. You are mm -hmm. going to get individual bottles, individual growlers, individual cans that are not right. And more importantly, it's going to happen in homebrew because homebrew is less consistent, obviously, than commercial examples. So if you have never tasted a light struck beer and you're curious about what we're talking about, seriously, just buy a bottle of beer and let it sit in the bright sun for not that long. 30 minutes. Yeah. If you really want to be sure that it's light struck, 
let it sit out there for a couple of hours. You'll definitely taste it and smell it. I would say you, you commented on a lemony quality in the aroma. I mm -hmm. didn't get it quite as much as you did. I get a lot of that lemony character mm -hmm. and flavor. I would yeah. say there's a bright citrusy, mm -hmm. and unfortunately still being masked a little bit by that, that light struck skunkiness. Yeah. Um, but no, it is really nice. I would say citrusy and bright. Mm -hmm. We're also looking for like that doughy wheat malt flavor. Um, typically these beers are made with somewhat around 50-50 wheat malt and American two-row malt. Um, so we are looking for a little bit of both of those characters. Uh, but this is this is really nice, I would say. Aside from the light struckedness. Right. Light strickedness? Light struckedness. Light striketh twice. I don't know. <laughs> I find this to be pretty highly carbonated as well. We've had a bunch of pretty carbonated beers. I would maybe say a little bit astringent. Yeah. But it's like there's like a maybe a little lingering bitterness and that could be some of the symptoms of light strike it yeah. twice it's like a hot bitterness that is unpleasant hmm. and that's coming from a hot head so overall this beer is flawed we cannot give it a world-class score even though it is a world-class example but there is a question of how flawed is it and i mm -hmm. would say that a major flaw should probably keep a beer under 30 points mm -hmm. a minor flaw if it's generally to style but has a minor flaw it can certainly score in the 30s i don't know though if i would give it more than 30 though because it is distracting in mm -hmm. every way and well, especially because for me it's coming through in the light or in the mouthfeel potentially yeah. so i would give it 30 tops yeah, I, I think I could give this particular beer something like a 31 or a 32. Um, not that I'm like particularly rooting for it. Uh, I also know that this beer is better. We've oh, yeah. We've both had this beer before plenty of yeah. times. And it's just so this one So don't be mad at us, Winmer. <laughs> Honestly, at some point, uh, we should probably retaste some of these classic styles if we've gotten bad bottles of them. We can mm -hmm. do sort of a... But I think there's more learning value in getting a bad bottle. Absolutely. So I'm going to give this a 32. Okay, then. Thanks so much for joining us for Category 1 Standard American Beer in the BJCP styles. It gets a little bit more interesting next week. It gets we'll a doing... lot more interesting from here. <laughs> next category up is uh, Category 2. That's the International Lager. And feel free to leave a comment below if you are tasting along with us anything that you perceive in whatever styles that you are tasting. Cheers! Oh, look how pale they are. Do you want to send us some spotted cow? <laughs>